right. Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those in Europe and uh, USA. Welcome to our Earth Day live. <laughs> this year, we have many reasons to celebrate. Um, it has been one year since the pandemic and have somewhat put our life and economy on pause. I think our response has been fantastic. Uh, we showed, we have demonstrated our capacity to adapt and ability to change, and indeed change is, is possible. For those of us in Australia, the last year has been challenging. We had the biggest bushfire, and I was told that about a billion animals perished during the, during the fire. And just about a month ago, we have the, uh, the biggest flood in, in decade. And it is said that what we do now, in the next 10 years, or what we do not know do will affect humanity for the next uh, 100 years will affect the life and death of coral reefs and, about, and also for the Arctic as well. So today's session is all about ocean and sustainability. And we have a panel, an expert panel with us. And um, to start off the session, to give our keynote address is her deepness, Dr. Sylvia Earle, our Times Hero of the, for the Planet, our Exploring Resident for the National Geographic, and she's also on the board of uh, Ocean Geographic as well. So, Hadidnas, take it away, please. Thank you, Michael. And, well, for giving me a chance to be part of this, this celebration, I suppose you could say. There is a lot to celebrate, despite all of the bad news that you referred to. Uh, the planet is in trouble, the ocean is in trouble, we humans are very much in trouble, but the good news is we, we can see it. We know what the problems are. We know what the cause of the problems are. We can look in the mirror <laughs> and understand that we're driving the climate change. We're driving the cause of the extremes that we now face it's time that we pay attention to the laws of nature and listen up. The past year has certainly been a wake up, if you will, the, the cause and effect. When we pull back from the ocean, everybody in the ocean celebrates. Yay, it's quiet. The, <laughs> the disturbance that once uh, was such so troublesome has diminished. The fishing, for a while diminished, but not for long. We are at a point in time where we have witnessed, and I certainly have witnessed in a lifetime, how our prosperity has been fostered by taking from nature, extracting from the forests, extracting from the land, extracting from the sea. I think we're right at the time where it's becoming apparent that the most important thing that we extract from the planet is our existence that we take from nature. Nature keeps us alive. And now we have to return the favor. We have to return to give back, to restore what we can of what's been lost. In my lifetime, as a witness, it's been exhilarating to see how much we've learned things that as a child i could not know no one could even the smartest people who ever lived before the middle of the 20th century could not know what the children of today are surrounded by knowledge of what earth looks like from space knowledge that the ocean is alive from the surface to the greatest depths, knowledge that the diversity of life on earth really matters in terms of shaping the nature of the world in a way that sets this planet apart from all those other places in the universe. <laughs> as beautiful as they are, they're certainly not habitable for us. Maybe for a few people who can go to Mars someday or the moon and set up housekeeping, but. 8 billion people? No, we've got to make peace with our own planet. And what is really exciting 
is that now we know what the problems are. We know what to do. The real challenge, which is the topic, I suppose, of what we're going to embark on right now is, okay, we know what to do. How do we get people to really take action? Collectively, that is with governments through the United Nations to implement the, the STG goals, the sustainable development goals that are, that are kind of okay, we can do better, <laughs> but at least it's a good start. Good start to say, let's, let's go from the goal of 10% protected of the ocean by 2020, that we didn't come close to that if you look at real protection, maybe 3%, close to 3% fully, where even the fish was safeguarded, have a safe home by 2030. Okay, can we get there with full protection? But that should not imply that 70% of the planet is up for grabs if we protect 30. I mean, how much of your heart do you need to stay functioning? In a way, the ocean is the blue heart of the planet. We have to take care of it, knowing that it keeps us alive. Of course, we'll use the ocean. There will be shipping. There will be some extraction of ocean wildlife. But knowing that, that the ocean keeps us alive should dominate our thinking and our actions when it comes to how do we treat the ocean. Right now, we are not respecting the limits and we are seeing the consequences, not just in the ocean, but as it affects climate, as it affects the diversity of life, as it affects every drop of water we drink, every breath we take. So I am really looking forward to hearing thoughts that this brain trust is about to suggest and put forward. How do we go from where we are to get to the better place that we know is possible? We have to bring the rest of the world along with us with that goal to treat nature as if our lives depend on it because of course they do. So back to you, Michael, let's go. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for the address. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, here to introduce the panel is our very own science editor, Alex Rose. <laughs> well, all right. Hello. Hi to everyone all over the planet who happens to be watching. Um, whether it's uh, actually Earth Day for you yet or Earth Day Eve as it is for us here in the US. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we've got a really great panel. Um, in addition to, of course, our, our favorite, Sylvia, um, we've got another five amazing people um, to talk to us um, about what's going on for them for Earth Day. Um, so just a tiny bit about this year's theme for Earth Day. Um, the first Earth Day was actually in 1970. So this is the 51st Earth Day that we're gonna be celebrating. And the theme for this year is Restore Our Earth. And um, the whole focus of this one is meant to be um, uh, natural processes, uh, emerging green technologies, and innovative thinking that can restore the world's ecosystems, both on land and underwater. And I don't think we could have a better group of people with us in order to have those discussions. So um, to start us off, we're going to be hearing from Esther Ann. So let me tell you about Esther. She is an active advocate for green building and sustainability for over two decades, and Esther has been instrumental in establishing CDL's leadership in sustainability. It is ranked the top real estate company on the 2020 Global 100 Most Sustainable Corporations in the World, uh, and is also, give me one second here, uh, and is also the only CDP A-list company for climate strategy and water security in Southeast Asia. As a forerunner in embracing the UN SDGs, Esther was conferred the 2018 SDG Pioneer for Green Infrastructure and a Low Carbon Economy by the UN Global Compact. So Esther, it is wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, it's a great honor to celebrate happy, you know, the Earth Day with, uh, uh, well, her deepness and uh, Michael and everybody here. 
Uh, okay, we hear you, and uh, we also know that eighty percent of um, well, the marine waste, and you know, it's actually from uh, men on land. So, uh, from a developer and a property uh, owner perspective, uh, let me share with you what are the stories behind it. And we all know that actually, uh, cities, uh, you know, carbon footprint is very high. We only occupy two two percent of world's uh, land mass, but we are accounting for two thirds of the world's energy and seventy percent of the global greenhouse gas emission in our building sector. We are also accounting for 36% of uh, energy consumption and almost 40% of the direct and indirect CO2 emission. And the good thing is uh, last year, you know, the world came to a pause. And, uh, but I think one uh, area that has charged really fast, it was sustainability. It was ESG, environment, social and governance. And in fact, COVID has reminded the world that the health of our planet, people, business, economy is actually interconnected and interdependent. And there was actually really clear sign of the convergence of you know, uh, international, national and industrial will and commitments. Asia or the U in, in, in Europe or in, in C40s and even in Singapore, we have also rolled out our own Singapore Green Plan. And I think the loudest voices actually uh, came from the investor, the financier, which will make a huge difference because businesses all need financial support. And apart from investors, there's also multi-stakeholders we have to look at, especially the younger generation and uh, who are willing to trade, you know, better, higher paid job for working you know, for companies with you know, social responsibility. And of course, we also have to look at you know, not just the investor, the people who control money, but also look at our internal stakeholder, employee, supplier, customer, and uh, the whole and, and, uh, community. And for CDR, we are very you know, glad that we have started our sustainability journey as far back as 1995. That was 26 years ago when you know, hardly anyone talked about you know, global warming or climate change in our parts of the world. But we have, what we need, uh, what we know is we actually, our industry can make a difference. The higher the environmental impact, the higher you know, uh, impact we could make. So that's how we started from small. We actually, you know, started with our own company and then our stakeholder and then enlarged to a larger ecosystem. Uh, green building has always been our priority over the last two decades. And our ethos is conserving as we construct, conserving not just the natural resources, but also the community and everything. So just now we talk about the UN SDG. We actually started embracing it since um, 2016. And uh, today we have actually embraced 14 goals. And uh, of course, apart from the green infrastructure, innovation industry, we have also embraced health and gender equality and you know, sustainable cities and communities. We need to build a community, not just infrastructure. And uh, studies show that people spend about 90% indoors. So whether you are in the industry or not, you have a, a, a role to play to ensure your building performance is you know, not causing you know, too much damage on the environment. And whether you're at, the, at home, at work or at play. So let me just share with you that you know, as a company, we have actually uh, you know, have a real, uh, very robust ESG strategy. And uh, we really integrate it into everything we do from the business strategy to the day-to-day -day operations. And we believe in innovation and adaptation. Mitigate risk is, is, is given, but how do we adapt it? How do we move the needle by applying technology and solutions? And we do believe in putting money where our mouth is. We have to invest in such technologies and uh, best practices. And of course, we have to track and report impact. And the th three things we are looking at the deliverable, just to summarize it, is to decarbonize our operation and to digitalize and innovate and to disclose and communicate with our larger community, not just the investor or shareholders or our employee, but a larger community. So green building has always been our top priority and we do invest two to 5% of the construction cost into every new development. And uh, today we have actually talked talk up a lot of, you know, more than 110 green mark award received um, uh, properties, whether it is residential or commercial, 
And uh, we also apply technology right from day one. And uh, AI and technology nowadays can really help us to start planning when we get to the plot of land, how to orientate it, how to maximize the use of natural resources, light and wind flow, so that we can design better and reduce heat gain. And so that we don't need to over reliant on you know, um, air conditioning. Singapore is near the equator. We are heating up also twice as fast as the rest of the world. And uh, well, definitely we need to look at how we can counter you know, the urban heat island. Uh, apart from technology, we can also look at greening. Greening, you know, greenery definitely can help to reduce and absorb heat. And on the left-hand side, you can see this uh, building, we call it a uh, treehouse condominium. And uh, this green wall, which actually made it to the Guinness World Record of the largest vertical garden, it actually uh, can absorb heat up to three degrees and protecting 48 units behind this green wall and, uh, and also reduce their use of energy and uh, study over one year that it actually really helped them to, break, to cool the environment, the indoor space by up to three degrees Celsius. So now, of course, we have to even think harder after COVID, uh, well, we are still at the, at, the, uh, at the tail end, I hope, you know, of COVID. And we also have to look at how we can design, build and manage our building, uh, not just green, but in a healthy manner so that all our building users will have peace of mind. And over the last year during lockdown, our home become our workplace, social place and almost everything. So when we build home nowadays, we also have to put priority and providing space for you know, uh, physical and also mental health, provide a lot of greenery and uh, also, you know, exercise space and community space. And then our future home will be one that have a lot of greenery and a lot of interaction. And uh, that's just to show you that actually this is already uh, in progress. Uh, one of our uh, latest development along the east, east coast of Singapore, which is already in construction, uh, we devoted for 65% of the overall site area for landscape facility or health space and even have uh, like, you know, a docking track um, above 22nd floor connecting three blocks and overlooking the sea. And of course, we also empower our home users to check on their air quality, looking at, you know, how to, you know, live healthier and future of our workspace, home space and social space will be all within a micro city. And hopefully with that, we can minimize traveling and we can also minimize carbon footprint of everyone. Technology will not stop and we need to do R&D and continues to discover and also improve technology, whether it is solar power or any other technology. And a month ago, we actually took the bold step to join, uh, step up our race you know, in net zero. And we will become the first company in Singapore to actually sign a pledge with World Green Building Councils to net zero carbon building commitment. So what we commit to do is we have to achieve one um, uh, one hundred percent net zero for our directly uh, managed building by twenty thirty in the all the operations of direct managed uh, properties. And we also have to track and disclose performance and do visit our website. We have our annual sustainability report just launched last week. And we also have to act on what we pledge to do. And to advocate, and this is really my pet project and a pet update. And we have been also working uh, with you know uh, Michael's team uh, to really uh, promote you know uh, both life on land and uh, conserving uh, marine life as well. So our sustainability uh, academy was designed and built and opened in 2017 just to, for that. It has become a hub for friends, you know, of nature. And we also have other, you know, um, national projects that is like, for example, my tree house, which is actually the first green library for children from three to 12 years old. And of course, our net zero green gallery is to reach out to the public. And last year, it was actually the door were closed, but we managed to do a lot of virtual events, including a concert for our youth climate. And uh, this is actually our pet uh, youth project. We call it the Yi Generation Challenge. We actually, um, uh, it's a competition to identify a very good, strong, committed eco-champion. We send them to places that, you know, have high climate challenge 
and uh, we, you know, Antarctica, Arctic, and in the center, you can see Michael and the team. And we sent two uh, uh, eco champions to follow Michael and the team to have, you know, did, I think they did about 99 dives and uh, look at how they can actually uh, do better to protect the marine life at Raja Ampat. And last but not least, this is actually in my tree house. And I look at the little boy, you know, she is actually our youngest uh, winner last year for our online eco storytelling. And what she, he say really moved and touched the heart of all adults. I am small, but I can make a difference. And for people like us in, in the industry, we have to build, design and manage better for our future generation. With that, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Esther, it's always such a pleasure to hear from you. You've got so much energy and so many ideas and it's always something new. You've always got something new going on and we just, we love that. So thank you so much for uh, sharing. Hang on, Alex, what, hang on, hang on, to. Alex. Uh, everybody, yes, Michael. before you go, look into the camera, I have to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take a picture. Look at the camera, oh, okay. give me a heart. Give me a heart, give me a heart, please. Everybody give me a heart, give me a heart. Yeah, ready and Picture taken. Okay, thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Obligatory oh, picture always has been done. <laughs> Even if it is through Zoom, that's fine. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Esther, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. So Esther. next on our amazing list of speakers is Natalie Chung. So Natalie is an environmentalist and social innovator, born and raised in Hong Kong. At the age of 18, she co-founded the environmental organization Fair Hong Kong to promote low carbon local tourism as a means to mitigate climate change. Last year, Natalie was appointed by the Hong Kong government as a youth member at the Council for Sustainable Development. Natalie, Natalie believes in the potential of the blue green economy and conserving ecosystems in the course of development. So Natalie, why don't you come and join us and give us your thoughts? Great, thank you for the kind introduction, Alex. I've learned so much from Sylvia and Esther this morning already. Thank you for pulling together this wonderful panel to celebrate the Earth Day this year. So I'll start my presentation. Right, um, so welcome everyone. Today I'll be sharing a bit on sustainability and domestic tourism and youth climate action. As Alex already introduced me, I'm currently pursuing a master's in environmental change and management at Oxford and hoping to step up my academic uh, pursuit so that I can be more equipped to save the planet with our youth's effort. As uh, Esther just mentioned, the youth is the future leaders for the planet and the stewards of the earth. So it's important for us to continue empowering and nurturing youth. Um, <clears throat> to celebrate this great occasion, we actually just launched our summer internship program for youth group, where we train around um, eight to 10 youths every year, hoping that um, they can start to gain hands-on experience in organizing some community scale projects. So um, these are some photos from previous years, even though last year was a COVID year, <clears throat> that we managed to group together a bunch of youths and organize uh, interesting initiatives and having a lot of virtual workshops and virtual eco tours for um, secondary and primary schools in Hong Kong. When you look at, when you think of climate change, we often um, see these kind of pictures. So this is an image of Hong Kong where um, Climate Central simulate um, the sea level rise leading to flooding half of our central pier, uh, a pier in Tim Sa Chu. And this image, we think it's um, taken in Europe or other places, but actually it's an image from Hong Kong. We do have a huge um, group of youth um, fair, being very concerned about uh, climate and hoping that our government can take bolder action in saving the planet. Of course, um, climate change does not only affect uh, the global scene. Hong Kong, even though it's a relatively more resilient city compared with um, other less developed regions, we do face uh, significant impacts from climate change and climate action as an SDG affects us. So um, in 2018, we had a super typhoon Mankat that smashes through Hong Kong. Um, it originated from around Philippines, but it caused a severe flooding and 
we called our attention to how buildings are designed and how our coastal areas are being protected. Of course, the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees shows that it is important for us to reach net zero by 2050 in order to keep our temperature within um, the limit of 1.5 degrees so that not all coral reefs will be um, extinct. And climate action is definitely urgent. If we decide to actively decarbonize, we're only spending around 0.1% of the GDP, according to a study by Burke, Davis, and Diffenbaugh. And if there are no action, we're losing 30% of global economic production. And I'd like to call your attention to this um, special piece of research in science in 2020. It shows that only 10% of the COVID recovery funds can already support a Paris aligned pathway, which means that if we're using these kind of economic recovery package, only a small portion of it can lead to a huge change in the green transition. For example, in our investment in renewable energy, carbon capture storage uh, technology, and many more. And it is good um, to announce that Hong Kong um, decided to step up our ambition to strive to achieve carbon neutrality by the year of 2050. It is a result of our public engagement process as I was part of the Council for Sustainable Development. And after collecting public's view, we, we found out uh, Hong Kong citizens actually do care about decarbonization. And eventually the government decided that we should set this um, ambitious target um, to be aligned with other Asian cities, such as Japan and Korea, who has also announced their target. And of course, China um, announcing their carbon neutrality target by 2060. However, there are still a lot more uh, we as youth or as the professional groups can push Hong Kong towards carbon neutrality. The first uh, point is that I think we can form more professional coalitions for policy research and advocacy because currently um, in the civil society scene in Hong Kong, it is mostly dominated by pressure groups, which um, may not be using a very scientific method, but rather like an emotional approach and storytelling to urge the government to do something. But we lack the kind of scientific expert advice, like for example, in New Zealand, they have a special um, scientific committee to investigate the impact and the economic requirement to achieve carbon neutrality pathway. So I think this is definitely needed. Another thing is continuing bottom-up education of the general public. Um, informing them the importance of carbon neutrality and decarbonization, as well as other objectives like blue green economy, promoting ocean conservation. And then uh, thirdly, I encourage um, all Hong Kong citizens to actively engage in consultation exercises to express your view and to tell the government that you do care about the future of our planet. And of course, last but not least, we can always reduce our own carbon footprint through conservation, diet change, and I remember attending uh, the Conference of Youth uh, back in 2019 at Madrid, where the UN Secretary General Antonio addressed us, saying that our message must not be a message of despair, but a message of hope. Things can be done, resources exist, and what, still, um, what is still missing is the political will. And this is where youth initiative is extremely important. We see um, the youth movement and climate action like Greta Thunberg uh, leading the movement to pressure our government to take a more serious look at uh, conserving the environment and saving our climate. Um, so this is some of the pictures that um, I organized the youth forum to inform the public on this kind of uh, decarbonization consultation exercise. And I, uh, this is a picture with a great SDG background, which is as uh, his background now um, at the COP conference. And I'll also like to address um, the significance of local tourism in combating climate change. Of course, and now we're all stuck in our own um, own countries because of COVID, but then it actually has um, some kind of reflections for us on discovering uh, our local neighborhoods and understanding what are the potential ecological resources that we've always overlooked because we relied a lot on uh, overseas traveling in the past. Um, so one of the major problem is that there is lack of multinational effort to tackle or limit aviation and shipping emissions in the past year. There are some kind of um, international agreements, but they are not legally binding. And there's also lack of an official system to display aviation emissions for the public, leading to a low awareness on the significant impact of aviation towards climate change, which contributes to around 3% of the warming.
So FAIR as a group, um, which I've co-founded in uh, 2015, we decided to adopt a bottom-up approach to promote local tourism through online media and organizing eco-tours. Of course, there are uh, tours around uh, ocean conservation as well as terrestrial uh, country park reservation. We're hoping to raise public's awareness on carbon literacy, especially on emissions from aviation and other trans uh, transboundary um, transports. And we hope to provide an alternative low carbon recreational option for the public. So it's not about um, one or the other, but then we hope to provide a new alternative. You can also decide to have a staycation and understand more about the geological features um, that Hong Kong has, which is also very valuable. So this is how we co-founded this group called FAIR. FAIR is actually a homophone to FAIR, which means green in French and combined with the spelling of air. We are a youth initiated social enterprise promoting climate action and environmental education through sustainable local tourism, hoping to inspire behavioral change to adopt low carbon lifestyles. So this is our mission and action area, including local tourism, public education and youth empowerment. And um, actually, there was a study by UN World Tourism Organization uh, showing the linkage between tourism and SDGs. They show that um, these three SDGs are the selected thematic focus for tourism, which is addressing uh, decent work and economic growth, uh, responsible consumption, as well as life below water. For us as a youth group, we think that there are two additional uh, UN SDGs that tourism can stimulate, which is sustainable cities and communities, uh, goal number 11, as well as goal number 13, climate action. Climate resilience is defined as the ability of a system to absorb disturbances and safe, uh, at the same time retain basic structure of functioning. And there are some existing rural um, areas that face uh, encounter different problems in Hong Kong. One of the important problems is that a lot of rural sites become abandoned, so they don't even have the tourism potential that people uh, oversee. And there's also loss of heritage because some uh, rural areas are being used for development, um, despite their high ecological values. And there are also intended environmental degradation to favor development, which we are very concerned about. For example, um, th three years back, there was a region in Yunlong in Hong Kong, uh, which is a piece of wetland, uh, habitating a lot of birds, migratory birds. But some uh, developers, they intentionally set fire on the piece of land, which is um, similar to um, perhaps issues encountered in Australia where you have a lot of uh, bushfire. But now um, people intentionally do that in order to decrease their uh, ecological value for development. And of course, last but not least, there are always conflict between private property right and conservation. And how tourism we see has the potential to tackle all these problems. First one is the use of infrastructure. Having developing tourism in rural areas can urge government to upgrade and maintain infrastructure to cater the needs of visitors, which at the same time can benefit the local communities. And secondly, it can lead to an economic boost, encouraging locals to make a living by selling local products. So rather than selling the piece of land to developers, they can uh, decide to retain their land and to make um, a life livelihood out of just maybe selling some local produce. And then uh, these abstract Assets can also act as attraction, encouraging rural stakeholders to maintain their assets like village houses and fields. And lastly, we can increase social awareness to, so that the public can also um, monitor the development process and protection effort of these uh, important areas. The classic ecotourism uh, model works like this. So we have biodiversity, which attract tourists to promote ecotourism industry and improve uh, living standards, as well as uh, reform land use and governance. We believe that um, stakeholders can be involved in sustainable development and resilience um, as tourists, as a society, as NGOs, residents, and government can all contribute to maintaining, monitoring, using, owning, and facilitating rural areas in Hong Kong. So we have um, two brief case study to proof like our simple theory. The first one is a piece of wetland in Long Valley. It had a controversial railway development back in 20, uh, 2003, and some environmental NGOs stepped in to halt the railway development. So now the piece of land is, is being um, managed 
uh, co-managed by NGOs as well as the government, developing as a site of conservation and ecotourism. And another case study is Sham Chung, which is a river valley located near a country park. Um, it was designated as one of the 12 priority areas for enhanced conservation back in uh, 2004. It has very diverse landscape and habitats. These photos were taken by me during a field trip of our university. Um, there are stream and grassland, woodland and mangroves, all in one, one uh, single place. And with increasing tourist inflow into Sham Chong, the village pier actually has been reconstructed by the government. Even though uh, the villagers have been advocating for it for over 10 years, the government did not do any action. But once there is tourism, they decided that this money is well spent and they, and they agreed to upgrade their pier infrastructure. And the roads are also flattened and paved with concrete, so villagers can easily assess the village. So as a conclusion, we believe local tourism can be a strong medium to stimulate first investment in infrastructure, especially for enhancing climate resilience measures, such as improving the dike and flood retention uh, facilities of a region. And it can also act as soft measures to protect heritage and environmental conservation. And last but not least, it's very important to enhance social awareness for community building and enhance bonding uh, within the local communities. Being able to maintain rural fertility and resilience without losing environmental and cultural qualities. Um, so we believe that um, the link between tourism and SDGs is not only um, uh, these goals, but it can, we can also add sustainable communities and cities and climate action to the role of tourism. And most recently, I want to share this um, uh, appearance on the television for me, which I advocated on conducting carrying capacity analysis to avoid over tourism. This is a marine protected area in Hong Kong, a very relevant to ocean geographic, and, and also designated as the UNESCO Geo Park. But you can see on the right picture, um, because of COVID, everyone has to stay locally. So. Um, all people went out. So we also hope to um, strike a balance between over tourism and environmental conservation. So we're hoping that um, before injecting money to improve a certain rural area or a valuable marine protected region, the government should first carry out carrying capacity analysis to understand which regions are less ecologically sensitive. So we can develop those regions first and leave um, some other more sensitive areas as it is. Um, so last but not least, I'd like to close with a quote, um, which I read from a book on humankind of hopeful history. It says that our green view of humanity is unnoticeable. If we want to tackle the greatest challenges of our times, from the climate crisis to our growing distrust of one another, then I think the place we need to start is our view of human nature. If we hold a hopeful view of, the human, of human nature, believing that climate change can be solved with all collective effort and um, with the effort of Ocean Geographic, with the effort of Sylvia and Esther, we can all be a part of this change. So happy Earth Day, everyone. And I encourage everyone to be an agent of change. Thank you once again for organizing this panel and letting me share uh, some of my insignificant work, but hopefully we can all play a small part in this grand scheme of change. Thank you. I think it's very thank you so much, Natalie. Very... We always love hearing from you. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say we do we we always love hearing from you, Natalie. We the way you communicate is always so clear and concise, and you have so much hope and vision for the future, and that that makes all of us very happy to see. So thank you. <laughs> all right, coming up next we have Shenjian. So Shenzhen is the founder of NOC, which is the Narwhal Ocean Research Center, which is an NGO dedicated to protection, publicity, and education about marine science, as well as environmental awareness through research and community partnerships. Their aim is to spread knowledge about marine life and to promote marine scientific exploration among civilians. They devote their efforts to the protection of marine ecosystems with the goal of driving the market and influencing the economy. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you, Cassandra, and uh, morning, everyone, and uh, very nice to see you again. And let me share my keynote. Just a second, please.
That's good. It's good. Okay. Yeah, good. And I don't want to uh, let everybody confusing again, so I will speak in China, uh, in Chinese. Okay. 嗯，当昨天呢，呃，当应该是在两天前 ，Michael 邀请我的时候呢，那时候我正好应该是在广东出差，然后我在深圳，所以说我在想，我正好在广东的话，我能不能去做一场呃简单的一天的时间的一个市场调研？所以说那天呢，我就去到了像是在，嗯，呃，印象城啊等等，万象城这样的一些比较高级的这样一些市场，然后我去看了很多的，呃，在这些地标性建筑的周围一些比较高端的这样一些餐厅。呃，然后比较让我出乎意料的是，因为在呃，相对比在十年前吧，在十年前的时候，我在广东出差的时候，有很多高级的餐厅，他们都会去用一些非常好的食材的原料，比如说像是鱼翅啊、鲍鱼啊这些，作为他们呃招揽客户的主要的这样的一些呃一些招贴画、一些这样的一些海报。但是我们可以看到，在这一次，我可以看到有很多很多的餐厅，它基本上已经放弃了去使用鱼翅或者鲍鱼这样去作为他们招揽客户的一个一个海报在这里。那呃，另外呢，我也去找到了一家餐厅，这家餐厅呢是、呃，在广东地区应该是属于非常有名的一家海鲜酒楼，然后曾经它的燕鲍翅也是非常的呃出名。但是我们可以看到，呃，作为它在它的一个呃宣传。当中宣传的这样的一些海报当中，他已经完全去不会去使用这样的一些，呃，鱼翅的一些产品。那当然了，我还是特意去到了这家餐厅里面，餐厅里面去看了他们的菜单，去看到他们菜单，然后我们去发现，呃，确实还是有鱼翅这道菜在这里面，但是。呃，我们可以看到，这鱼翅那道菜已经是放在呃最后一页，放最后一页也是非常不起眼的地方，而且只有这一道菜是可以去做成鱼翅的。然后其实那个时候呢，我本来想去拍呃这个呃呃 menu 在那边的，然后但是呃因为考虑到服务员就在边上，然后 Michael cannot pay for that， so I gave up that that idea、yeah.。呃。当然了，就是如果只是去看到一些餐厅的话，我觉得这还不是能够去证明佐证这些，呃，我们现在在鱼翅在国内的这样一个交易量。所以说，我也去查了很多，用通过我们自己的那个大众点评，呃，来去查到了很多在呃深圳地区的这样的一些餐厅。我们可以看到，现在主要以好评优先，或者说是口味优先的这样的一些餐厅当中，其实燕鲍翅它的排名已经非常的靠后了。那当然，我也会去呃搜寻一些，呃，就是特地的去搜寻一些关于燕鲍翅的这样的一些餐厅。我一发现，其实这些燕鲍翅的餐厅还是有很多在这边，呃，确实有不少的燕鲍翅，而且我点进去看了以后，也确实有呃不同的。这样的一些关于鱼翅的做法的这样的一些套餐还是在进行销售的，但是我可以看到，呃，相对来说他们的受欢迎度可以通过他们的一个评新以及他们的这样的一些，呃，这样的一些，呃，他们的就受欢迎度啊，以及他们的评论度可以看到，其实相对来说他们呃已经是并不是那么受欢迎的这样的一个。呃，状态。然后我们可以看到，在这张呃这个 page 下面的呃左下角有两张图，这两张图呢是目前我们在上海，我可以去在这个时间当中，我可以去找到的一些比较好的餐厅的一些婚宴，呃一些一些 wedding dinner 这样的呃一些一些呃菜单。我们可以看到，其实在这些菜单当中，这些呃相对来说消费。也并不低的这样一些菜单当中，其实鱼翅已经慢慢的去推出，呃，退出了这样的，呃，在我们婚宴市场的这样的一个，一个一个市场中。对，然后这个呢是在今年三月份香港互沙会在市场上，就是在海鲜市场上去拍到的这样的一些。呃，一些资料我们可以看到，现在有很多的鱼翅，它已经开始进行了非常大的这样的一个降价，呃，有将近。嗯，降价了百分之二十，开始对市场上进行一些促销。其实也可以看到说，呃，呃，销呃，是因为非常多的这样的一些呃销量的，就是下降，其实对整个海鲜市场还是有很大的这样的一个影响。对，那当然我们现在可以看到，目前在国内为什么会造成这样的一个状态？呃，我觉得有几个原因，呃，几个原因我们可以去说一下。首先，第一点肯定是一些明星的力量。呃，我们现在有越来越多的一些艺人啊，一些 idol 啊，他们开始加入到这样的一个呃保护环境，甚至是保护海洋环境的这样的工作当中来。然后，呃，甚至呃，可能大家都很很难相信的，这每一个艺人，他至少可以影响到两至三三千万人
，他们有非常巨大的一个影响力。比如说，我们可以看到像王一博，王一博的话，啊、呃，聊到王一博，可能要那个 Sex Peter again， 对，他又是邀请了这样的一些，呃，比较在国内有流量的这样的一些人，包括黄渤，有越来越多像黄渤一样的。呃，艺人开始喜欢上潜水，开始加入到潜水的这样的一个行业当中，所以说他们也会去，呃，身体力行的去宣传大家说，呃，能够去保护海洋，拒绝鱼翅等等这样的现象。那当然，除了像是，呃，这些艺人的这样的一些努力，其实还有很多企业的努力。我这边可以，我为大家介绍一下，在中国我们有一个这样的一个基金会叫阿拉善，它其实是由在中国非常多的这样一些企业家去，呃。组成的这样的一个，呃，一个基金会，那它其实有将近超过九百家的企业会员。我们可以想象，九百家的企业会员，他们都进行同时进行了一个非常明确的规定，就是所有的在阿拉善中的企业家是不允许吃野生动物以及不能吃鱼翅的。所以说这一点的话，就是通过这有九百家企业，通过这九百家企业的领导人，呃，就九百家企业的拥有者，他们其实可以影响到更多他们的中层，以及更多他们的一些。员工，所以说这些企业的力量也是非常的强大。呃，当然，除了企业和一些 idol 来说，在中国还有更多更多的一些呃民间的在网络上的一些意见领袖，我们可以看到他们会做了很非常多的这样的一些漫画，也做了非常多的这样的一些视频栏目，通过各个各个就是 social media 上面，他们在不断的去传播说关于到海洋环境保护的这样的一个一个一个阵容当中来。就是说，嗯，综上来说，呃，最让我们会感到欣喜的就是，嗯，因为我们其实我们知道，现在目前有非常多的一些，呃，采用极端方式的这样的一些，呃，呃一些一些 NGO 也好啊，一些个人也好，但让我比较欣喜的就是，目前在国内的市场来说，我们并没有特别多的一些，呃。一些非常极端的一些做法，那当然会有很多的一些 KOL， 很多的一些呃相对的学者啊，或者说是一些大 V 啊，他们都会去通过很理性的一些呼吁，通过大家希望大家能够通过科学的这样的一个保护方法来去保护到鲨鱼，保护到海洋环境，所以这点是让我非常呃感到呃欣慰的，也是非常让我感到高兴的一点。对，呃，就像我去年去年去说的。呃，在去年的时候，我们有说到说，呃，目前呢，我们在中国来说，对很多年轻人当中，拒绝吃鱼翅已经是一个非常重要的一个时尚了。在我们的日常工作当中，甚至很多接到很多的九零后，他们都会在问我说，为什么要吃鱼翅？呃，因为不吃鱼翅，至少是真的是一件非常 fashion 的这样的一个事情。那当然，我们必须要承认，在中国，我们还是有很多的关于鱼翅的这样的一个问题是存在的。在老一代的中国老一代人当中，确实是因为悠久的一个呃。历史文化的一个影响吧。其实我也去呃走访过很多年龄比较长呃比较长的这样的一些长辈，那他们会去讲到说，呃，鱼翅可能会因为对身体有好处啊，或者说是呃能够能够帮助啊，或有健康这样的一个功呃这样的一个功效。那当然我们会跟跟他沟通啊、呃，可能有些重金属的堆积啊，或等等。其实他们更会宁愿这些老人更会宁愿相信一些一些呃。就是有着悠久历史的这样的一些传说吧，嗯、呃，但是，但是，但是我还是相信说，在未来的时候，在未来的时候，嗯、呃，可能不出五到十年，越来越多年轻人也会在影响着这些年纪大的这样一些老一辈的人，所以在嗯、呃，对于未来来说，我们觉得中国鱼翅的一个交易问题上，我们觉得还是比较保持乐观的一个一个比较这样的一个态度。那当然，因为在呃。二零一九到二零二零这两年当中，我们确实因为呃受到了疫情的影响，我们没有拿到太多太多关于鲨鱼和呃鱼翅交易的这样的一些呃 detail 的这样的一些数据。嗯呃,呃，也是通过呃感谢就是 Michael 邀请，在这两天的时间内，我去做了一个呃在实地在广东实地去做了这样的一个小的调查。那基本上我目前能够反馈到的一个情况就是这样子的。好，谢谢大家。Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. It's so encouraging to see numbers like that. To to know that shark fin consumption is actually going down places, and the demand for it is going down. That's always a good thing to see, especially when、uh, you know you're looking at it as an outsider's perspective. It's hard to know if the efforts,、uh, everyone's efforts, actually are making a difference. But it seems they are, which is always great news. So thank you for sharing that. So our next speaker is going to be Philippa Rowe. So let me tell you a bit about. 
Pip, yay. No. <laughs> uh, so Pip started out as a scuba diving instructor, using the profession as an opportunity to travel, having completed her undergraduate degree in social anthropology. In her current role as head marine biologist and research coordinator, research coordinator of the Maldives Underwater Initiative at Six Senses Lamu, she oversees a team of seven marine biologists in collaboration with three NGOs, all working together to achieve a sustainable and well-managed marine environment in Lamu Atoll with their base at the resort. PIP has recently launched a major project aiming to understand the natural recovery of Lamu's reefs since the catastrophic mass coral bleaching event in 2016. So PIP, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and yeah, I'm so grateful to be part of this event today. And what I'm about to share follows on really well from uh, Natalie's presentation. And also I've seen a recurrent theme of um, mixing emotional responses with scientific backing. Um, in Shen's presentation as well. So hopefully this will add to that a little bit more. Um, so as Alex said, I'm the head marine biologist at um, Six Senses Lamu, which is this beautiful resort in Lamu Atoll in Southern Maldives. Uh, the resort itself was built about 10 years ago and it has uh, 97 villas, uh, 70 of which are on these overwater jetties and um, 27 <laughs> of which are in the jungle, set back a little bit from the beach. Um, but what really sets Six Senses as a brand apart is the concept of wellness and sustainability. And this isn't just wellness um, for our guests, but also for um, our hosts or our staff and the environment. And it's something that Six Senses uh, takes very seriously. And it's visible uh, to our guests in their villas. Uh, for example, we um, don't have any single use plastic on our amenities working towards zero waste. And we try and produce as much as possible on the island. Um, so this is really important for a country of like Maldives where resorts and local communities uh, rely really heavily on import. And we found that some of our most, uh, most of our waste was from packaging. Um, so one of our ways to overcome this is through um, uh, having a small permaculture garden. Uh, so we have our own garden on island. Uh, we produce um, vegetables, herbs, um, sprouts, and we even have a mushroom hut where we grow our own mushrooms. Um, and a chicken farm uh, where we have uh, chicken eggs. We use them for eggs. Um, and it has quite a few chickens and just two roosters. Um, so through this concept of producing as much as we can on island, um, we reduce the packaging. We also reduce the carbon footprint of having everything imported in. And also we know exactly what is in our food, um, how it's been produced and where it has come from. So every Six Senses property has this concept of sustainability and has similar aims. Um, but a second aim is also to assimilate and blend into the natural culture and the natural environment. Um, so being based in Maldives, um, which is a country that is more than 99% water, um, a lot of this is driven through marine conservation, which has led to the team we have uh, today. So the resort has always had a marine biologist based, um, based here. Um, we started off with just one. And as our ambitions and projects grew, um, the team multiplied and got bigger and bigger, um, inviting uh, the uh, advice of experts and um, adding to the knowledge, which has built the team today. Um, but before I move on to the team, I'll talk a little bit about funding. So funding is often a big barrier to conservation. Um, but here at the resort, um, all of our funding really comes from our guests. So 0.5% of the total revenue of the resort goes into what we call a sustainability fund. And this fund can only be spent on community and conservation projects. So all of our partners um, and all of our projects in the community and our conservation, particularly marine conservation projects, are funded by our guests and the resort itself, uh, which really helps us achieve a lot of these goals. Um, so our team is, as Alex mentioned, we have seven. Um, it's marine biologists employed by the resort itself in collaboration with three different NGOs that we work with. And having partners with NGOs um, is what has helped us really gain expertise from different people um, and move forward in real conservation goals uh, rather than just ticking over. Um, and through this collaboration, um, we're called the Maldives Underwater Initiative. That's the title of the whole group together. Um, and we hope to set an example in the tourism industry in Maldives. Um, there's, I'm not sure exactly how many resorts right now. There's always some closing, some expanding new ones being built, uh, but I believe it's more than 150. 
and every single one of these resorts has its own island. So each resort really has a responsibility for the location that they're set in. Uh, they look after the reef, or they should do, and their island. Um, so I'll just quickly highlight um, one project from each of our partner NGOs. Um, we have quite a lot going on, um, but this hopefully shows what we've achieved through partnerships. So uh, through Blue Marine Foundation, we've set up a, a sustainable fishers collaboration. Um, this is basically a code of conduct that the fishers sign um, and they pledge or they agree uh, not to fish in certain areas of the atoll that we believe are particularly ecologically important. Um, in addition, they don't take certain species and also they don't take fish um, under a certain size, which means they haven't had a chance to reproduce and repopulate the reefs. And in return, the fishers get a slightly higher um, price for their catch. And also we have a token scheme. So every single time the fishers sell to us, uh, they get credits. And also every time they complete a data sheet for us, they attend a meeting or they attend a training session, they get these credits as well. And these can be accumulated and exchanged for anything such as a head torch or even a boat engine if they save them up for long enough. So um, it's really a, a win-win situation for both parties. Uh, the fishermen um, get a reliable source to sell them to. They get slightly um, better returns. And also we get fresh fish and reliable fish that we know has been sustainably caught. Um, so Blue Marine Foundation has been spearheading this pro program for us, um, kind of as a consultant and also as part of our um, partner NGOs. Um, our second partner is the Olive Ridley Project, um, and they uh, focus on sea turtle conservation and also um, ghost nets, addressing the issue of ghost nets. Um, ghost nets are any discarded fishing gear that kind of floats around the ocean and um, inadvertently catches marine life as it goes. And one thing that often is caught is turtles as they come to bask on the surface. So some of the research they do with us is a population study. So by using the side of the face of the turtle, we can identify individuals. Um, and then from that, we have a huge database of almost 600 turtles now, just from the different locations we visit in the resort. Um, they also help us uh, research and monitor nesting and hatching. Um, Hawksbill turtles being critically endangered and green turtles being endangered worldwide. It's really important to know that their populations are increasing and that they are reproducing. So on Six Senses Lamu Island itself, uh, we currently have eight turtle nests, I believe, and they're all green turtle nests. And uh, through the collaboration with Olive Ridley Project, um, we know how successful those nests are. Uh, we know how many individuals are coming up to lay those nests as well, which can then go into better management um, protocols uh, further down the line. And then our longest partnership has been with the Manta Trust. Um, we're fortunate enough just 10 minutes away to have a manta aggregation spot um, and since 2014 um, the trust has been monitoring these sites for us so we've managed to identify certain key areas that are aggregation sites uh, for these species. Again um, they're endangered worldwide um, and of course they bring a huge amount of tourism to the Maldives. Uh, many many people come and spend money just to see these creatures. Um, so by understanding their distribution and their habitat use, um, we then know how to better protect them too. Um, they also have a similar identification on their bellies. If you take a shot a photo of their bellies, you can see which individuals they are. And then we can track their movement around the atoll or even to different atolls um, throughout Maldives, uh, which is super exciting. And again, this can go into better management plans. And then also at the resort itself, um, so Six Senses runs some projects um, through marine biologists um, like myself employed directly by the resort. Um, and one of the things we do is every single dive and snorkel, every single time we get in the water, we use it as an opportunity to collect data. And this is a part I'm really getting to, which is utilizing the tourism industry as a means to support conservation and also um, provide this scientific backing as well. Um, so what we've done is we've developed a protocol um, and trained all of our dive team and also all of the snorkel guides and marine biologists. Every single time a guest goes in the water guided by one of us and we write down the environmental conditions and we also record all of the sightings of different megafauna we've seen. So we turtle sharks rays and Napoleon wrasse. And these are all species um, that are hugely important to the tourism industry and bring people to Maldives um, every year. 
Um, many people come specifically for the marine life, the underwater beauty, um, and it's really these megafauna, the big animals that are attracting them here. So not only are they important to uh, the reefs, but also to the Maldives economy. And because of this, uh, the megafauna have been nationally protected top down. Um, so all of these species, um, all turtle, sharks, rays, and Napoleon rays are protected from hunting and export. But their major threats now are um, habitat destruction or loss of their habitats. So in order to make sure that they are fully protected, we also need to protect the habitats that they use. And by doing this, we need to make sure um, we understand where they're going um, and when they're going there. So by us recording all of our sightings every time we get in the water, um, we can start to put together a picture of the habitat use of these different animals. And we've had some really interesting results. Um, so the facts on the screen are from 2019, which was our last full year of study. Uh, we managed to be in the water 364 days of the year. We just missed that one day. <laughs> it must have been stormy. Um, and we had 18,942 sightings of different megafauna. And we did over 2,500 surveys across 50 different sites across the atoll. So if you were going to employ a research team to do that volume of research, it would be hugely costly. But by doing it through the resort's normal operations, um, just by uh, recording things we see as we're going out anyway, uh, we've managed to collect all of that information. And we found some interesting trends such as certain shark species in one monsoon season, when the wind is coming from one direction of the atoll, they use different areas in comparison to the other monsoon season. So this is really important information to um, make sure that any management, um, marine management in the atoll uh, reflects the areas that are really important for the marine animals as well. So it's not just about the marine life, even though that's our passion and it's why, why we're all working here as well. Um, we also look after all of our staff, um, which are our hosts on the island. Um, so we do a lot of education with them and also uh, different pillars of wellness. So we have a, a program called Mission Wellness, um, and that is targeted particularly at or everyone who's employed at the resort. So more than 50% of the staff at the resort are locals. Um, so they really are our gateway or our key um, into the community as well. Um, so we host events like this. Uh, this was a chance to name a manta ray. We identified a new, a new manta in the atoll. Um, and using VR, even those people who can't dive or can't uh, even swim, uh, we had a video of the manta ray cleaning station that's right on the resort's doorstep so everyone could see that manta. Um, by doing little education sessions like this, everyone gets excited about the marine conservation initiatives and we hope that they also take it home to their home island or their home atoll as well. Um, and then leading on more to the community. Um, so no conservation or even tourism operation can really work uh, without being fully accepted um, and part of the community and support the community um, in which it's placed. Um, so to facilitate this, um, Six Sense Islam, we set up a meeting called Eku Eki, which in uh, Dibehi, the local language means together. Um, and this is a, a meeting where all different stakeholders across the atoll, so atoll council members, the police, people from different schools, uh, they all get together in one room, COVID restrictions pending. Um, and we uh, discuss uh, different concerns or project ideas um, that anyone can raise to the resort. So often in Maldives, there's an atoll that has many different resorts, whereas here in Lamu, we're the only one currently operating. Uh, so we have a responsibility to the whole community. Um, it's about 13,000 people uh, to try and help them and them help us as much as possible. So in these meetings, uh, we also receive proposals for the sustainability fund. Uh, so the fund doesn't only um, support marine conservation, but any member of the Lamu community can write a proposal and get funding for a project um, as long as it's uh, kind of sustainable to your wellness or, or community focused. Uh, these meetings are also an opportunity to plan big events uh, such as Lamu Faro Festival, which means Lamu's Reefs Festival. So every year we invite all 13 schools to the same island. Um, all the kids don't often have that much opportunity to meet each other. Travel between islands can sometimes be quite hard. Um, so we get them all together in one place and we um, have music, dancing, sta uh, a stage, uh, everyone eats together and also it's a chance to share education and celebrate uh, Lamu's marine lives and the habitats in which they live. 
Um, so these meetings are really key um, for the resort to not be outside of the community, not be a foreign, uh, a foreign organization like just placed on the atoll, but really be part of it and we can help each other as much as possible. And then we also run, uh, we visit the schools, all 13 schools, um, and we run an education program called Hello Hello, which means Hello Solution. Um, and this is trying to get kids to be um, the innovative thinkers and uh, the, uh, what we call um, the people of the future to try and try and make a difference. Um, so we do different classes, which includes taking the kids into, into the field, into the seagrass meadows, into the mangroves, um, and show them and talk to them about what's happening with them. Um, are these habitats degrading and what can we do about it? And we donate snorkeling equipment to them as well. And we also teach kids to snorkel um, if they don't even know how to swim. So through these projects, we hope that as these kids grow up, um, they will teach their kids also this. Um, and finally, it's not just about um, the marine life and the community. Um, all of this is supported by our guests and we couldn't do it um, without our guests. Um, the team hopes that every single interaction we have with a guest on the resort is an opportunity to inspire them and take a little bit of Lamu, a little bit of Six Senses back to their home too. We do this by guiding snorkels, we host dolphin cruises, we do presentations every night. Um, and we also run a program called Junior Marine Biology. This is where kids aged six to 16 um, spend some time with the team. Uh, we do a little classroom session, a session we discuss certain topics, um, and then we take them either on the beach or into the water, um, and we do a different part of marine biology. So it's anything from designing their own study and conducting it, to sharing the results or sharing a conservation message, and trying to show them that being a marine biologist isn't just about being in a lab or being in the field. It can also just be online and sharing messages that way too. So we hope to inspire these kids to take these different career pathways. Um, you don't have to study marine biology to be a marine conservationist, definitely. And then while the resort was closed, we took this program online um, and we did a 10 week course that anyone across the whole world can join. Um, and it has a little videos um, and then little tasks that they have to do and they can send back to us. Um, it was quite successful. We had at least 80 kids that were doing it consistently across the whole 10 weeks um, and many others that joined in, in and out throughout. And we marked all of their homework when they sent it to us and we sent them little videos back as well. Um, so this is a great opportunity to reach out to people that might not ever have a chance to visit Six Senses Lamar Resort, but we, they can also have a bit of Maldives and a bit of um, our concepts back in their homes too. And this leads on a little bit further um, to our voice. So we hope that um, we can inspire other resorts in Maldives um, and also across the world to live by this um, sustainability concept. So particularly with COVID, we found that the guests that we have here are traveling um, more consciously. They're thinking about it more and they're appreciating it more. And I think that's really the way forward for tourism, um, especially with concerns over carbon emissions and long flights. Uh, travel is really important. It opens your mind, you experience different cultures, you experience different environments, and it really makes you care about it more. But to travel, you need to travel consciously and it needs to be a transformative experience rather than just a holiday. And I believe that guests are doing that more and more now since being cooped up in, in, their, in their rooms, in their houses or wherever they've been throughout COVID. Um, more, they really appreciate when they get a chance to go somewhere else and experience something different. Um, so we try and inspire this through all our different social media channels as well. We recently um, launched TikTok. Uh, we weren't sure how that was going to go, um, but we're trying to reach out, uh, stay a bit ahead of the game and uh, reach out to, to the kids using TikTok. Um, uh, hopefully it will be successful, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to thank you so much. Um, and hopefully this, this whole concept will, will spread like a wildfire across across all tourism operations. Thank you. Thank you, Pip. Well done. Fabulous as usual. Yeah, that's just, it's, it's consistently amazing to me how much one resort can do, you know, when you've got the right team of people working together, it's, it's just incredible. And if you think about that multiplied for every resort and then not just every resort in the Maldives, but all over the world, if they could all operate a little bit more like this, wow, mm -hmm. tourism could be such an amazing force for good. So. Thank you for, for telling us about what you're up to. 
And on our continued trajectory of talking about tourism, last but certainly not least, um, our speaker to close out uh, today's session is going to be Monique Ponford. So uh, let me tell you a bit about Monique. Ever since her first trip overseas to Europe at the age of 11, Monique's innate sense of wanderlust has never wavered. Now at the helm of Aurora Expeditions as their CEO, she can share her love of pioneering expedition travel with equally passionate ex -nurse. With a new purpose-built ship named the Sylvia Earl, which is launching in November 2021, uh, with a bunch of new global itineraries and ongoing sustainability, health, and safety initiatives, Monique will be working with the entire Aurora Expeditions team to deliver life-changing experiences in and beyond the polar regions to some of the most biodiverse corners of the planet. So Monique, thank you so much for being with us on Earth Day to celebrate and we look forward to what you have to tell us. Firstly, it's a great privilege to be here today. Um, thank you so much and hello to everyone. Yes, I'm Monique Ponfort, um, CEO of Aurora Expeditions, award-winning Australian-owned small ship expedition company with 30 years of experience in expeditions. Um, Something remarkable happened when Sylvia Earle said 97% of the Earth's water is ocean. It's our life support system and we need to learn everything we can about it and protect it. Um, it is this critical thought that resonated with Aurora Expeditions as we begin the most special connection with Dr. Sylvia Earle. Here at Aurora, we're a small ship expedition company, award-winning, as I mentioned, um, Australian owned. We have 30 years of experience in going to the polar regions with respect. We offer next level experiences. We travel to some of the most remote and fragile places on earth, including a network of marine protected areas and hope spots, and we are deeply connected to the places that we go. We are truly committed to environmental responsible travel and we live for those incredible moments of discovery. Care for the planet is at the center of everything we do. We are serious about sustainability. Science and education is an essential part of what we do every day and the opportunities that we give our guests on our expeditions. We are undeniably authentic and take real actions for the care of the planet. We are founding members of IATO and founding members of AECO. We have a highly educated and experienced expedition team of naturalists, historians, marine biologists, glaciologists, geologists, paleontologists, um, just to name a few, and we go to some of the most beautiful remote expeditions and we have outstanding activity and expedition professionals with us. Excitingly, we have recently um, introduced a new head of sustainability at our Sydney office, uh, which shows our commitment um, to our efforts into the future. Female scientists are leading the way in global conservation initiatives here at, and here at Aurora, we are honouring women scientists who tirelessly, um, who work tirelessly in making the world a better place by paying tribute to them on our new ship. I'm so thrilled to introduce the newest ship in our fleet, paying tribute to an incredible hero for the planet, Dr. Sylvia Earle. But it's more than just an incredible namesake. The Sylvia Earle is an ambassador for the ongoing protection of the planet and it's a base camp century on all of our expeditions. On the Sylvia Earl, we have dedicated each deck and the theming to honour each of these women champions of conservation. From plastic pollution campaigner, Jo Ruxton, to Arctic wildlife guardian, Bernadette Dimitriev, to coral conservation champion, Dr. Carden Wallace, future generations educator, Sharon Kwok, as well as to incredibly inspiring young conservationists, Dr. Asha DeVos and Hanley Prinsloo. 
we shine a light on the important work that we are doing, that they are doing, and all of their causes. And, and we educate our guests. But it doesn't stop there. Travelling on board Aurora Expeditions is an unforgettable opportunity for people to learn about the incredible marine habitats in situ and become ambassadors for protecting them. We will open people's minds as guests on board the Sylvia Earle will have the opportunity to truly participate in science education via a citizen science program. From Hope Spots, at the moment, we're visiting more than 15 in our current itineraries, Hope Spots throughout the world. We're working on a very special citizen science program, which will include a variety of very exciting initiatives from micro, microplastic surveying, seabird surveys, or one of my favorite, which is the Happy Whale program. <laughs> Additionally, we will be providing our guests with the opportunity to provide any contributions to the conservation causes we're shining a light on. Sustainable practices on board and throughout, uh, and throughout our business. The ship design itself emulates that of a dolphin that glides through the ocean with ease. The Olstein Expel minimizes vibrations and reduces fuel consumption. We're deeply committed to continuing to evolve our sustainable practices and the ongoing engagement with our employees, customers and communities. We have the greatest respect for the places we visit. Our expedition team scouts new, de new destinations and meets with communities that we travel to. We educate our guests via lectures on board and, and how to behave in the environment they're about to experience, how to interact with wildlife and in the communities we tread lightly. And together in this collaborative and powerful partnership that Aurora Expeditions has with you, Sylvia Earle and your team and Mission Blue, Michael Law and Ocean Geographic and all of the, your volunteers, we know that together we can go beyond as there is more to do. There is so many opportunities for us to continue to extend our efforts together. As Sylvia so beautifully put it once that we as humans have to understand that our lives really depend on taking care of the aquatic parts of the planet. We do, and we're so privileged to work with you, with you all. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Monique, well done, thank you. Thank you. We're extremely excited about this new vessel and can't wait to see it. And you couldn't have picked a more perfect name, that's for sure. So very cool. Thank you so much, Monique. Thanks. Well, Michael, this looks like we've gotten everyone. We've got everyone, but let, <laughs> let's hear from Sylvia. Let's hear from Sylvia, stay around. Let's hear from Sylvia her, 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 to finish, us, finish us, uh, this session off. Okay, all right. Let's have Sylvia close this off for us. And then I'll close it. <laughs> okay, double close. <laughs> That's really exhilarating. Cause for hope to hear from all of you. This is a moment in time that we must, we must seize this time. If only we knew 50 years ago, what now is known, imagine how much more we could accomplish. It's still within our grasp, it's harder now, but we cannot fail. We just cannot let this moment pass. I said many decades ago, the next 10 years will be the most important in the next 10,000 years. And it was true. We had opportunities available going back to the 1970s and the 1980s, and then into the 1990s, every 10 years. The opportunities just got harder. We have now, early in the 21st century, the last best chance we will ever have 
to embrace the natural world and restore some of what has been lost, enough perhaps to secure an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that keep us alive. I suppose we should forgive or try to some of our predecessors who made it harder for us today by taking so much so fast, more loss in the last 50 years than during all preceding history when you really look at how quickly the technology to be able to, to level forests in, in, in days that once would take a very long time with a lot of effort to just clear a patch for a garden or for a house. That's no longer a limitation. We can burn huge areas, either intentionally or through the, our actions that are changing the climate that are causing the terrible fires that of the sort that we've experienced where I am here in California that have been experienced in Indonesia, have been experienced in Brazil, and certainly in Australia. So what are we waiting for? Nothing, we have to can't wait, we must get busy. We must take all of the good ideas that you've been discussing here and then magnify them, bring others on board. Although there is a growing constituency of people who do understand the problems, there are a lot of people who really do not. And Have we lost Sylvia? Oh, yeah, we lost. You're still here, but we lost your audio for some reason. Oh, no. Yeah, there she is. Well, can you hear me? Oh, there you are. You're back. Yes, there was a blip. You're back. <laughs> All right. So for the ocean, we really need to look at the problems addressing what we're putting in all those plastics and also what we're taking out, especially the industrial scale fishing that also puts a lot of the plastic in the ocean that has been adding to the misery in the sea for many decades. The idea of ghost nets that were deployed back in the seventies, they are still there. And there are a lot more now than there were decades ago. It just keeps adding and adding. Knowing what the problems are gives us the best chance we will ever have to solve these problems. And so I'm looking at hope, at all of you, looking at the kids who are looking to all of us to take care of the world that they are growing up in will soon be under their guidance. So I think the climate scientists are, are really on, on mark that, that looking back, we can wish for better ideas, better change, better behavior. But 10 years from now, we will know whether we have made it or not. Climate change is upon us restoring health to the forests, restoring fish and other creatures to the sea, having large areas that nature really is safeguarded. Little places matter, but big places matter even more. I look at the Maldives and the leadership there. We need to expand the places where even the fish are safe so that the ocean is safe, so that we're safe. And, and it's true around the world. I see some countries like the little island nation of Palau taking 80% of their entire exclusive economic zone and retaining 20% for their local uses. But they don't trash any of it. You, know, it. you have to live within your means no matter how much you use. So this is truly a moment that I'm excited to be a part of the action excited to be working with you 
looking forward to what happens next all around the world with the hope spots, with the actions that you are taking from all over the world and bringing it into focus. So we have to protect the natural world as if our lives depend on it because of course they do. Back to you, Michael. Thank you, Sylvia, for your wise words of wisdom. Um, thank you, Esther, Peep, Shen, uh, Natalie. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we are all inspired uh, with, with, your, with your work, uh, and Monica as well, for the Sylvia O. We are all inspired mm -hmm. now, and I think the, the idea is to uh, keep the conversation going, uh, walk the talk. Uh, you know, one thing you can, everyone can take away with us is uh, instead of uh, seafood, we like to use the word sea life in state, you know, I think we need to give more depth and meaning to, to, to life in, in, in the oceans. And I uh, hope to see everybody on board the, the Silver Arrow next year soon. And thank you everyone <laughs> and have a great uh, Earth Day. Thank you, Alex. Thank bye. You. Thank you all. Bye. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.